So good afternoon and thank you for coming. Uh, particularly those of you that are uh, attending outside of the master today, it's really a pleasure to have this talk on Benchy's broadcasting uh, with uh, Dave Lanner. And the uh, talk will be given by Professor Herman Kramer. And well, uh, he's an uh, associate professor at Students uh, Institute of Technology. And uh, well, what surprised me is uh, his background, because as you can see here, uh, he has taught in different universities, uh, in US and Latin America, uh, but also his background is uh, very interesting, because you can see from psychology, sociology, economics, uh, financial engineering, and computer science. So it's, uh, I think for uh, some of you, it's something that are starting, it's a good, and uh, perhaps we can share some comments with uh, him about the, a career like this that covers from human sciences to computer science. And I think this is a very interesting uh, curriculum to go <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> He has also worked in industry, like in American Express, uh, senior manager in risk information and marketing division, uh, also in South America in the Banco del Pacifico in Ecuador, uh, United States the United Nations Development uh, Program also, an uh, advisor of the President of Ecuador and uh, Guinea Equatorial, and also consultant in several hedge funds. So well, we have uh, very very important, very relevant experience. <laughs> and on research, uh, uh, research centers are computer finance, and uh, risk management, automatic trading, decision support systems, business analytics, machine learning. So I think it's a very interesting uh, opportunity uh, for you that are starting to learn about machine learning, to learn how to apply these technologies into a very interesting which is the financial uh, sector. So, well, uh, it's all of you. It's a good presentation. I just would like to uh, uh, say a few words about the generous introduction of Lewis. Uh, when somebody look at that and I say, say, well, you didn't know what you wanted to do in life, well, that's partially true. Uh, <laughs> but the other true is that since I started my career, I was more concerned about questions about human intelligence and human potential. So I started exploring more from the social science area and progressively moved into economics and computer science, and lately I was able to integrate all these different views. So instead of just studying different areas, what I see is a way of how they are converging, and I think that in that respect we live in a very interesting world where we don't necessarily have to choose. Like when I started my career, uh, we have to choose. So either you are an engineer, you are a lawyer, you are a medical doctor, uh, but now the, the possibility to integrate many different areas and instead of deciding just studying one particular area, it's more interesting to study uh, particular problems. Uh, so when you have an interdisciplinary perspective, then obviously that helps you to have a richer solution to those problems. And that's more the approach that I have now. So <coughs> basically I would say the uh, uh, presentation I have or the work I'm doing is more applying computational methods, and what I use is the framework of computer science more as a system science that helps to give a, a, a broader perspective that could be applied to many different problems. In my case, I particularly use it to finance, but we finance with a behavioral perspective. Uh, why is that? Because <clears throat> if you see the typical models or models of economics 
or finance, they have been motivated by uh, elegant mathematical models, but they didn't have really the human component, assuming, for instance, the idea of a homos economics, somebody that only optimize economic function, which we know is not true. So the late development of behavioral finance or behavioral economics show you that, on the contrary, there is a very rich area of research uh, if we include human behavior. So in my case, that's exactly what I do, but instead of forcing, uh, again, a, a particular theorem or, or, or trying to match what Philly says, my starting point is from the data. So if I am studying a financial problem, I try to capture what the patterns are from the data in terms of, of human behavior, and from there, try to understand the, the, the financial problem that I face. Right? So in this particular case, <coughs> uh, one of the main problems that we have in the development of time series, uh, machine learning, is how to integrate these two point of views. Uh, the literature of time series has come mostly from uh, econometrics or financial econometrics, <coughs> while machine learning has emphasized problems of classification, uh, but they definitely both complement each other. Uh, so in this joint work with my colleague Ricardo Collado, Ricardo Collado, we use an approximate dynamic programming approach to see how we can uh, integrate both of them. <coughs> uh, so going back more to the main problem that we have here, <coughs> When we are studying uh, historical data, uh, uh, generally one of the main problems that we have is that many of these models are formulated in a way that they follow a certain pattern. But they don't necessarily incorporate the special events or jobs. But we know that any financial time series you can take or any economic time series that you can take have good jobs. Uh, if we concentrate on the normal side and forget about the jumps, then definitely we will have a very uh, boring, let's say, forecast because we will have just a normal process, but not really what is interesting. If you are a trader, well, you can make money, a little bit of money, just with the regular trend of the market, but the business opportunity is really is when the market jumps in both, any of both directions. So the main challenge here is how are we able to anticipate those major events, those major changes in the market that helps you to change the nature, right? And one of the main problems that we have had with the traditional time series model is this lack of <coughs> uh, identification of different regimes. And by, by regime, I mean like different states of the economy. Uh, it is not that there are no models like that. We have several models in economics like uh, uh, regime switching models, uh, <clears throat> uh, but they are still based on certain macro-marketorial models that we explore here. And that is what exactly we are emphasizing, trying to explore models that are considered in different states. And in those states, those different states will consider also these major jobs, these major changes in the economy. <clears throat> Now, what would be the data sources for us to capture this different information? If we only use the financial time series, it's like a, a self-perpetuating process. Uh, we don't necessarily are including anything extra. Uh, one of the major developments that you can see in the current recommender systems, not only in finance, in any area, is how they use the context information. For instance, if you follow Yelp or the recommendations that you follow, that you receive from Amazon, they say, well, this is the next book that you need to buy. Or in Netflix, this is the, based on your pattern, this is the movie that you should see. How do they come with those recommendations? The initial models were based on a simple frequency analysis. If you always selected comedy movies or, or drama movies, that's the type of movie that you receive. But now, this system has become much more interesting. They mix that decision that you take, but in different moments. So it's very different that you choose a, a romantic movie in the night 
versus a romantic movie at launch. They can mean different things, and they understand that as human beings, we the same topic or the same object, we could interpret it in different ways. So the way how they use this extra information, which is the context, is what help us to identify that something different would happen. So in that case, we are using external information, social information, to take an internal decision. And that's exactly what we are trying to do. In our case, we are trying to use context-based information that help us <coughs> to improve our time series forecast. And what is that uh, context-based information? It's any information that we have out there coming from news, coming from tweets, or images, etc., that can give us an idea of what's happening out there in the market that can lead us to certain changes in the market that we can predict. This type of study can have many different applications, like financial markets, the energy markets, where I really some special concentration in this presentation. <coughs> uh, but we will see that in all these different markets, we have this possibility of how to integrate different sources of information. And let me go to some details of the energy market. But for that, I will give you some basic concepts of financial derivatives that we will use as a reference in, 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 in our talk. So when we're talking about energy future markets, we have these three main type of contracts, forward, futures, and options. These are <coughs> basic derivatives that probably you have used uh, in other contexts or maybe in other financial class. Why we are using these products is because they have some information about the future. So what is a forward contract? A forward contract is a contract between two parts that they decide to trade a particular asset, could be an energy or a financial asset, at certain time in the future at a fixed price. We also have the futures, which is exactly the same. However, they don't necessarily <coughs> fix the price today. The price is fixed at the end of the contract, given certain uh, indicators that will happen at that time. So in that case, in the second case, the future prices makes a big difference. And finally, the options are agreements between the two parts to trade. However, one of them, the one that is buying the option, will have only the option. So depending on the direction of the market, that person could execute or could not execute the option. Now, what is common in these three products is that they are all based on future markets on future prices. How can they establish future prices if we don't know them yet? Well, those are based on the expectations of the investors in the market. So the investors that know very well the energy market, they will say, well, the energy price may jump 10, 20% this year. So that is incorporated into this forecast. There are different sources of how the market can reach that decision. We are not studying exactly how they reach that decision. However, in this research, we are using that knowledge of the market as a way for us to anticipate the future prices. Right? So as I told you before, we need to use some context information. And one of the best ways for us to have an idea about future prices is using what the traders are already using today. In this particular case, are the prices of the futures, of the forward, or even uh, options. Now, coming back to a particular application, <clears throat> I chose this because it leads to certain, certain difficulties, and but at the same time, if we are able to solve this, this will have a very positive social effect. And I'm referring to the electricity prices. The electricity prices normally <clears throat> are traded through a competitive wholesale market, which is like exchange, and they are called the power tool, where basically all the sources of information come there, and the companies are going to sell that, that energy to each of us, buy in, in blocks all that amount of energy, and they have a fixed price that depends, of course, on the condition of the, of the market. But first, one of the problems with those prices the pool prices are that they are very hard to forecast. Why is that? 
because they come from different sources, and we don't know what is going to happen with the energy price in the future. Again, they could be affected by political events. What happened if there is a new crisis in the Middle East or in Venezuela? <coughs> there are main oil producers. Definitely, they will have a, a big impact on the oil prices. Uh, also, from a statistical perspective, they are non-stationary series. What does it mean? Non-stationary means. Uh, oh, we don't have the right model. That's right. Oh, oh, I see. I don't have a If not, that's okay. very stable in this direction, and then something like that. So let's say that we split that series in three moments. <clears throat> Here we calculate the average on this one, roughly the average there, and roughly the average there. As you see, the average for each of these three moments are different, and also the variance, I mean the dispersion, is much larger here than here or here. So this is the example of a non-stationary series because the mean and the variance is different in different time periods. So they are very hard to predict. In financial time series, it, it is necessary, typically, the first conversion that we do with financial time series is to trans transform them into a stationary series. So that is one of the challenges that we have here. <coughs> and then <coughs> the third component that we have here is the information that I just introduced about financial futures will be extremely important for us to make predictions. So even though we have these limitations, however, the fact that there is a very well-developed market of futures, <coughs> that will give us an indication of what will happen with these problems in the future. Now, an example of what happened with this series is, are these two cases here. This is one type of series from January to June 2009. And as you see, we have a mean of 39 here versus 45 there, which is here's the first semester and here's the second semester in 2009. It happened what I showed you here, that the, the mean jumped from one to another. <clears throat> and the median also jumped. Uh, if we generate a forecast using a Gaussian distribution with these moments, we would have a forecast something similar to this red line. However, the real series is this blue line. So as you see, there's a big difference between the forecast that we could have only based on the statistical moments versus the true series. Uh, somebody could say, well, but at the end, we get a very similar result. Everything converged to this point. Well, yes, but if you are a trader, you don't want to get only the last part. You are really concerned about all the intermediate positions because that's when you are buying and selling, and this could be a very interesting profit opportunity. So, coming back to the problems of the energy market, <coughs> uh, the fact that the energy is traded uh, as a single market helps to increase competition, have lower prices, etc., more reliability, so it becomes a more efficient market on one hand. But on the other hand, the problem is that the demand is insensitive to price fluctuations. What does that mean? It's like each of us. It's not because the price becomes more expensive. We say, well, now we will sleep without air conditioner or, or heater. We, as humans, are used to certain level of comfort, so we may maintain those demands, or we will use the car in a similar way, unless that the jump of prices is 
extreme. <clears throat> uh, there are several constraints in terms of supply of energy at peak prices. Uh, so that puts limits in terms of how the pr prices could be modified. <clears throat> and finally, at the short term, the price for ele electricity can be very volatile. So again, from a practical perspective, how to forecast that becomes very difficult. One of the alternatives to deal with this problem is to, first of all, have long-term wholesale contracts. But the problem with that is how can we have these long-term contracts if we don't have a very good idea of prices? So one way to deal with this problem of prices is to <coughs> create a system, which is what we're trying to do here, uh, a dynamic time series system that will help us to have a good idea based on future prices of where the energy prices will go. So this is just to show you an example of an application of this type of technique. You could use it in any other area, but just to show you a practical application of why when we are able to integrate these two dimensions, you can solve a very practical problem that affects all, all of us. <clears throat> now, when we look at the time series, we have two sources of information. <clears throat> One is the historical data, which is already incorporated in the any time series that we're evaluating, like this one here. <clears throat> uh, typically, this, more, this will work well when we have an underlying model that is fixed. Supposedly, all this process corresponds to a particular model. But what happens if, because we have a non-stationary data, it might be possible that the process that happened here is very different from the process that happened there. So we may have a very different model. <clears throat> Uh, however, we have the second source of information for us is the exogenous process. Uh, what, what, what is all this? These are all the historical observations that are happening at the same time. For instance, if we <coughs> look at the history of the Navy in the <coughs> United States, So let's say we have here time, and here is the SP500. <clears throat> and let's start the series since the 1990s. We go to 2000, 2001, 2006, <coughs> 7, 8. I have exaggerated these years because this become very important. And then we reach 2019. Okay. So if we follow this series, at the beginning of the 1990s, there was a, a, a real estate housing prices, but the economy recovered. And these were very good years, especially with the Clinton years. Even though he has had all kinds of scandals, it doesn't matter. The economy went, did very well. And, and that's what matters for many people. But we reached the year 2000. And what happened there? There was the dot-com boom burst. All the startup companies, internet companies, had exaggerated prices and reached a maximum level and then the economy dropped. Also, during this year, something else was happening. Does anybody remember any special event between 2000 and 2001? What did I say? 11 days. The second, yeah. <coughs> So we have, of course, the big uh, September 11th uh, catastrophe and something else. From a political perspective, does anybody remember what was happening there in those years? The war in Iraq. Yeah, it was the war in Iraq. However, it happened to be before. That's true. That also affected that. But one of the main aspects here was the war versus Bush <coughs> elections. Mm -hmm. If you remember, Al Gore won the election, if we think in terms of the popular votes. However, the Superior Court in Florida gave to Bush the, the decision, to, decided that Bush would want 
uh, the election, because they never been to recount all the votes, etc. Uh, but during that period of time, it happened a few months, three, four months, created tremendous instability of the market. So finally, the market pretty much collapsed, combining all these different situations. However, the US economy is very, has a very good capacity to recover. So even though the market went down significantly during that time, it still recovered. And can anybody remember what happened in 2006, 2007? It was the maximum price of real estate. Real estate prices were at the peak there. And then in 2007, they collapsed. It went down. And then in 2008, it became worse. It was the credit crisis. And it reached a bottom in 2009, March 2009. And if you invested, if you buy, bought the stock, in 2009 until today, that would, be, would, have, would, be, would have been a fantastic return. Okay? So how can you create a time series model that would have captured all these tremendous dynamics? If you only use the typical time series, <coughs> uh, you would have, during this time, any time series, any time series model, the last 10 years would have said that it well, they continue like that, but of course it went into a different direction. Once we are going down, how do we know the moment that it will change? So that's the main challenge that we have here. <clears throat> and again, the idea is that these exogenous prices supposedly will help us to capture these additional external changes. Right? Uh, so how can we incorporate that? Again, we're not studying all the details, but some of them <clears throat> Could be based on news, on tweets, or social media, or other different sources. <clears throat> In our case, we are incorporated, incorporating the prices of the futures, of financial futures, but these external sources will help us to complement these different models. So again, I don't want to give the impression that this is the first time that somebody said, well, how can we evaluate different regimes? No. It has been deeply studied before that the regime switching methods are very popular in economics to study these changes of the state of the economy. Or in computer science, uh, you have seen what are called expert weighting algorithms, which are algorithms that change according to their performance. So definitely in the literature, you see a large history of models that are trying to incorporate <coughs> Uh, a, 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 a not different states only of the economy, but different capacities, capacities to forecast the economy. So using these alternative data sources like test and news analysis, or social networks, or finally sentiment analysis, our idea would be that <clears throat> we could have a richer time series forecast model that is not only dynamic, that is able to capture the evolution of the economy, but also context-based. And finally, capable of integrating social text and sentiment data. Right? So for this particular presentation, we are presenting this stochastic dynamic programming model uh, using this external forecast and then incorporating the alternative data sources. So let me introduce a very basic time series fitting process, how it is done. Let's say that we are in the initial state of the economy. S corresponds to a state, S is zero. <coughs> the problem is that we don't know what is the next state. So here, let's say we're exploring four possible future states. <coughs> How this model works is the original state depends on our original random variable. In this case, is X zero. <coughs> and then the future movement that we will see about the economy will depend of an external action that we can take. So by external action, I mean a, a decision either taken by economic agents or policy makers, whoever it is, but it's a particular action that will affect where the next movement goes. So that's the result of the next equation 
that we see here. In this equation here, what we see is that there is a clear <coughs> effect of the action that we took, A0, given by this parameter, plus a stochastic factor, which is epsilon 1. <coughs> Why is that? Because if we don't have that, it's a deterministic model. But obviously, there's always a stochastic component. And all the sets of possible actions that we could take define this set A of actions that we are going to explore. So given those possible actions, let's say we take one decision, and that leads us also to a new menu of options, and we continue like that until we finally find the path. So that's a very simple example of how a time series fitting process works uh, and a very simple approach using dynamic program. <coughs> If we formalize this, uh, I know maybe not everybody here is familiar with this model, but let me try to explain more in the way what we have here. <clears throat> the objective here is to minimize the expected cost of this process. By cost, what, what it means? The cost refers here to how good is of or how good or model fits the true series. So if it is a very bad model, the cost will be very high. If it is a very good model, the cost will be very low. So that's what we are trying to minimize. Uh, but that cost depends on what? Of the state of the economy, ST, and the action that we take. Now, the action that we take will depend of a particular policy, PT, that will also depend on all the input that we are giving. So basically, we are taking one action giving a series of input, and that could lead us to different costs. The objective here is to select the policy that minimizes this cost. And the solution, the typical solution, the text solution for this problem is what is called the Bellman equation. So I want to expand using this basic Bellman equation. How do we guarantee that we have a solution for a problem like this? First of all, we assume that the set of actions A that we have is compact. By that, what I mean? That there are only several actions that we are going to consider. Otherwise, there are so many options that the problem becomes very difficult to solve. So we limit our problem to certain actions. <clears throat> the cost function is lower semi-continuous. <coughs> that means it has a shape like this where we are able to find at least a minimum <coughs> point. <clears throat> and we have a measurable selection of the action that belongs to the set A of actions. And then the function, there is a function that goes from the state S to the cost function that we saw before. And all of them are given by certain level of probabilities. So using a stochastic model and the probability that different actions lead us to a certain result, that's how we are able to find the solution. And that solution is obtained by this kind of function that we call Q. Right. So to find a solution to the system, we need to define a value function. And what is the value function? In this case, we are making a quadratic function to the cost function that I just introduced. This cost function has two components. One is the current cost. By the current cost means, again, how fit today's value fit how well today's value fit the true value? How close we have or for or forecast fits the true series? So if we were doing a model like this, <coughs> we are evaluating, let's say, we also have a forecast like this. That would be great if we could have a model like that. But maybe our model was not as good as this one. And <coughs> could have been a linear model like this which in average seems to be OK, but you see it's a very bad fit. So the first component in this value function evaluates the cost that we have here between the true value that was the original blue line and all forecast, the red or the black line. Now, there is a second element about the future values. The problem is that once we are here in 2019, what is the value 
that will happen next. That's what really matters for us. Once we have reached this moment, <coughs> let's say we're here, what comes next? Will the economy keep expanding? Will it become just a stationary state, a fixed state, or <coughs> will it go down? Well, we don't know in advance that. <coughs> and that part is what we are capturing with this expected value of B at the next peak. So <coughs> the model that we are using, the Bellman equation, <coughs> uh, we try to find an optimal mark of policy that satisfies this equation. In this case, what we are doing is finding out what is that action that minimizes this cost plus the future cost that we will have. So that by the future cost, again, I refer to this part here. How close or future forecast matches the real value of the economy. Okay. <clears throat> now, one problem that we have with the traditional model that we are using here is what? <clears throat> that the model that we use select here does not affect necessarily all the future observations and costs. If that is true, the expected value of this cost function that we have given the state and the action is equal to the expected value given the state and even if the action was different. So here we have A, the only difference between these two sides is that here we have A and here A prime. Uh, so basically we can rewrite the same equation minimizing only the cost function of today's prices or today's states obtaining uh, the optimal action. But that's a very myopic problem. Uh, if we decide to follow that path, it's a very simple decision. It's like choosing the best moment based on all these observations that we already have, but we are not incorporating what will happen next. So our model gives more emphasis to the possible states that we will see in the future. So how to break with that myopic policy? And that is a Markov model that we are introducing here. So by a Markov model, it means two different things. One, it is a stochastic process. By stochastic, I mean that it's based on a random variable. We don't know what, is, what are the next steps. So there is an important random component that we are incorporating there <coughs> first. And the second aspect of a Markov model is the simplest model would be that the future value only depends on the current value. So for instance, <coughs> if we have the variable, here we have the variable <coughs> uh, of the SP500 at this time, let's say time T1, the variable the same variable at time t yes. uh, at time t two is going to depend only of t one. It will not depend on the complete series. So the advantage with that is that at every state we only need to look at the previous step. That simplifies significantly the analysis. Otherwise, at every future <coughs> forecast we need to evaluate everything. So the Markovian model, in the thought, seems more complicated, but simplifies our analysis with that simple resolution. So in this case, we have a stochastic process given by this variable xt, and it follows a, a time series from zero to capital T. <clears throat> and we are going to find a model, a parameterized that model, that means what? To find the particular parameters theta that satisfies the equation of our model. Okay? Now, the different states that our model can take <coughs> is what corresponds to the observation that we have. So that would be what we already have today. So that's nothing new. If we already know that, that's HT. HT minus 1 corresponds to the previous series. And finally, <coughs> how we calibrate our model corresponds to these different parameters that fit the model. So basically, <coughs> with these parameters, we are able to define how we, def we classify each particular state. <coughs> and 
we are going to evaluate our model with a cost function I mentioned before, but it's going to have two parts. One part that is a good bit of field test. So that means how good our forecast, as we saw before, matches the true value. The second component is a penalty for, for a change of model. Why is that? Because it is possible that we say, well, this part of the economy corresponds to a certain model. Now let's change it, let's use a different one, another one. So if we are continuously changing model, that means that we may not have a very good forecast. We may not have necessarily a very good model, and we are always reviewing the standard model that we use. So to avoid switching too many models, that second component penalizes uh, this extreme dynamic. <coughs> So here we have an example, and we can forget about the technical part. Basically, the first component is called AIC. In the time series, <coughs> you have what is called archive information criterion. And that is a typical indicator that is used for any time series analysis, and it has two components. One is about the accuracy of our forecast. And the second one is about complexity. So basically, any time series can be evaluated by how close it matches the true series, and second, it penalizes if it is a very complex model. So the, the logic is that the best model is the one that makes the best prediction in the simplest way. That is what the AIC indicator evaluates. So that's the first component. The second one simply is another way, we don't get, need to get into the technical details, but it's another way to show you how when we are switching models that give us different probabilities. So this is probability uh, using the parameters of theta t and these parameters of theta t minus one. There's a, an important difference. If the models are not changing much, the difference will not be very significant. So there's not a big effect. But if we have very different models, there will be a big jump between this component and this component. In that case, the, the model is penalized. All right? So now we have two ways to reevaluate our models. <clears throat> and come back to the original series. So this is the original problem that we have of how we fit the time series. But the improvement is that one dimension will reinforce a good fit. And the second dimension will avoid that we switch to too many models. So we also have the new decisions as we had before, but as we advance, we are restricting our options using these two criteria that I mentioned before. Okay. Now, how we introduce all the external information I mentioned before? I went through all this story to indicate all these ex extreme events that might also be captured by certain indicators. So <clears throat> to do that, what we are going to have is assuming that we have a forecast random variable that approximates the true value. What is that? That would be the example I gave you about the future series. So let's say that today we are here. We are following the energy prices. And now, <coughs> we have a good forecast <coughs> of what would be the futures series. So this corresponds to the financial futures that I told you before. These are the prices at what the energy, energy uh, uh, products are traded in the future. So what we're going to do is to use this series that is already produced by the traders as an approximation. So this is the x hat that we have here, and supposedly this series would be a good approximation of what we would expect that would happen in the future. <clears throat> now, in the basic model that we are going to evaluate, here I'm trying to give you a more intuitive explanation, explanation of how the model works, is <clears throat> we initialize our value function, the cost function, for uh, an initial value, whatever it is, we just define that, also as the starting and the state S0, 
and then we go through the time series, zero to capital T. So at every state, we are going to update the state variable. <coughs> uh, and how we are going to update that state variable? Well, that is going to be given by the value function that I showed you before. So as you see, we always come back sorry, to this original function that we have here, <coughs> which is the cost function, that first captures the current state or the current forecast plus the expected future values. So when we solve this equation in every step, then we are able to evaluate how good or, or model fits the future. Uh, so for every step we evaluate that, we, <coughs> we are going to use the new forecast <coughs> if the current state corresponds to the state that we're forecasting, otherwise we maintain the one that we have there. And we continue like that for all the series. Now, the problem with that is that we have made only one possible uh, part of the economy. But the economy may have many different parts, like the one that we have here. So one way to solve that is to do what is called the Monte Carlo simulation. <coughs> What is the Monte Carlo simulation? In the Monte Carlo simulation, we run many different possible scenarios. All of them based on the random variables. Why is that? Because we don't know where the future is. So one good alternative is to throw many possible alternative future steps that we will follow, <coughs> and then the idea is that the average of them at certain point of time will tend to converge to the true one. Okay? So what we are going to do now is apply this basic Monte Carlo algorithm to the look ahead method that we had before. So we follow the same process. We initialize our value function, choose an initial state, and update the state value as we did before, minimizing this cost function. <coughs> But the advantage is that we are going to repeat the same exercise many times as we do here. So we are going to have the result of the value function for many, many different possible forecasts. And ideally, when we run this many, many times, the true, form, the true value will emerge. And that's the one that we are supposed to make our forecast. Okay? So that's in essence what we have uh, in terms of forecasting or model. Let me show you some experiments to how we apply this in practical terms. <coughs> so here we have used two very well known uh, methods for uh, regression and classification. So poor method machine and random forest. I'm sure you have used them in your classes, right? In machine learning. <coughs> uh, why do we choose these two? Because they have different uh, ways to solve problems. So, in the case of some poor vector machine, <coughs> if we have a classification problem, let's say this is one class. Ideally, what we need to do is to find out what is the hyperplane that separates the two classes. And the solution of the support vector machine is finding the margin, what is called M, that maximizes the extreme values of one class versus the other class. That is one approach. And the second approach that we are using here is random forest. <clears throat> In the case of random forest, What we have <coughs> is a large number of trees that are randomly created in the sense <coughs> that we follow a bootstrap process to generate many samples. So remember, with random forest, we generate many, many different samples, and all these different samples lead us to different trees. At this point, <coughs> A second source of randomness 
if you have to forest, is the number of components that we use. So we select, let's say, five nodes. So we are going to have only five nodes for every tree, but as we have many different samples, all the trees are going to be very different. The whole idea with Rando Forest is when we generate many different trees with very random components, somewhere there in this forest, we will find the, the true forecast. Right? So that is how Rando Forest works using the advantage of uh, randomness of the data set. <clears throat> when we apply this for the ratio, we average among all these different trees the forecast that we have, and that's how we find the solution. So I selected these two methods. Sorry, this is too fast. I selected these two methods because <coughs> they are different ways to solve the same problem. In both cases, we are applying uh, a, a machine learning method to forecast a time series, but with very different ways to solve the problem. So the idea is that we are not using a small variation. We are using possible uh, two methods that are not related to each other, so they may, may lead us to very different results. However, if we integrate both of them, we may have a better result. So that is one part of our initial analysis. And we also need to have an external forecast function. And that is the log return of the WTI series. This is the series of oil prices <coughs> and using the future prices of every month. So again, this is the, the, sec, the series that, that I mentioned you that we use like the external forecast series. <coughs> Uh, for our analysis, we split our data set on training and test data set, and we have 15 lags of the dependent variable, and using many technical indicators, the like moving average, volatility, uh, <coughs> momentum indicators of the price series, all of them give us different aspects of the financial time series. <coughs> so with all these elements, now we make our forecast, <coughs> and we are using First of all, WTI corresponds to the, the general line is the one that we are going to forecast. Now, we are using ARMA 1.1 as our benchmark. What is ARMA 1.1? <clears throat> that is the most basic time series model. It's autoregressive moving average model. <clears throat> And 1-1 one, one <coughs> refers only to the lags that we're using. So that's the most, that's the simplest time series model that is used. And we can use that as a benchmark if we were using only the time series model. So when we use a time series, a simple time series model, we almost have a, 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 a continuous uh, horizontal line. <coughs> uh, if we were using the support vector regression, without any transformation, a regular support vector regression, our forecast would have been this gray line. Why you see that the general line is above that. So it's not necessarily so bad. It's definitely better than ARMA because it's following the pattern, but with different values. And finally, when we use the SBR with the approximate dynamic programming, which is the method that we're using here, as you see, it follows very closely the original time series, right? When we do this analysis also with random forest instead of SBR, <coughs> we see a similar result. Here we have ARMA, and now <coughs> a random, the original random forest is not as bad as we saw in the case of SBR. It follows more closely, but definitely the random forest based on the approximate dynamic programming, which is this blue line, follows much more closely the general line. So both methods, <coughs> random forest and SBR, seems to show improvement when we apply the methodology that we propose. We can see here using the root mean square error. What is that? The mean square error is a simple indicator uh, to evaluate time series. Simply tell us how close our forecast is to the true value. So a larger value is bad, a lower value is better. 
So in this case, this is the Rubin square, a square error for R011, the simplest model. And CART, which is one of the typical decision trees, classification and relation tree. And we did CART, CART uh, times 10, that, that stands <coughs> for uh, running the, the uh, evaluation 10 times. Why is that? Because CART is based of a very random component. So we want to make sure that the result doesn't change because of the random effect. So we run it many times and just report the average of all of them. So these are the standard models that we use. We compare them, again, SBR and random forest. The difference here is that the, the yellow bars corresponds to the static model without any change. <coughs> and the blue bars corresponds to all simulation using this approximate dynamic programming model. So as you see, in the case of the SBR, as I showed you before, there is a big reduction in the root mean square error, and less in the case of random forest. It, it is a, still an improvement, but in the case of SBR, there is a huge improvement. <coughs> if we <coughs> use what is called a matrix correlation coefficient, uh, a matrix correlation coefficient is a very good method to evaluate classification algorithms. It tells us what is the correlation between our, our, our forecast and the true value, especially when the series are unbalanced. So we could have like, very few positive values and many, many negative values. So you use an accuracy test, it's very hard to interpret it with that. But the matrix correlation coefficient is able to interpret very unbalanced series. So in this case, <coughs> Uh, a lower value is bad, and a high value is good. Means a high correlation between our forecast and the true series. So, as we saw before, now the decision tree, the basic decision tree card, it was a lower value. Uh, for SBM, definitely the ADP model is better than the static version, and likewise in the case of random forest. <coughs> We could also see that from the test error perspective, which is another way to evaluate the classification problem. In this case, the test error is very large for CART, and it also improves with the approximate dynamic programming method versus also in the case of random forest. Okay? So I have other examples to show you with different variation of series, etc. but I would like to stop here uh, and listen if there are comments or questions, if, and if necessary, I will show you the rest. I just wanted to give you a practical example of how this could has been applied. And uh, also, I simplified the analysis concentrated on <coughs> one particular series, energy time series, that are approximated by future prices, but you could have used anything else. You could have used news, or you could have used any other additional a variable that you think that may approximate future events. Okay. So again, please, if you have any comments or questions, let me know. I came, I have a grade, so I missed part of the, 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 the whole class. Sorry. That's so maybe my question is going to be maybe a little bit. Uh, uh, this, I, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, it reminds me a lot about a uh, reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. You have an agent, and you can, and you have a state, and this state can be like a market signals, or it can be like the tweets or news or whatever, and you can train this agent. But this agent can be trained uh, with policy or with uh, value, and it's reward with the same as your cost, I guess, in the presentation. <coughs> but uh, my question is, this uh, model that you show us is like a space, space model that is linear. It depends on, on time. But uh, when in reinforcement learning, you can make that the agent learn a like, very complex model that doesn't have to be linear. Well, no, this model doesn't yeah. have to be linear. All right. No, no, not all. Okay. Well, that's why I show, that was very part that you missed when I showed you the evolu evolutions of the time series. And um, I'm coming on so far your own question. Uh, yes, between reinforcement learning and the solution that we have here is very a very similar framework in the sense that for reinforcement learning you also have a value function. Yes. 
Uh, the difference is how exactly we solve that blind function. Yeah. Right? Uh, so in, in this particular case, we are using also a Bellman's equation that you could also use for reinforcement learning. But the most important part here, which makes the, 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 the difference, okay, is how we defined this function. Yeah. How we define the second component. You see, the, the structure, if you know reinforcement learning, very good, I have to allow to understand this framework. Think about this as a reinforcement learning framework with the variation of this element here. Why is that? Because that's the one that incorporates the variation of the exogenous future variable. In the typical reinforcement learning process, what you do is more you go by a trial and error, in the sense that you're trying to find the solution, you find that you make a mistake, then you learn, and go back and try something else. For instance, if, you are, if it is a robot that is trying to find a solution in a puzzle, it would work like that. In this case, we say, well, instead of trying everything to see what works, we have a possible solution. There is this path that we need to follow. And so that path is evaluated with this second component. So it helps to simplify our analysis. Yes. Why that is so important? Because think about the following. <clears throat> Many solutions that we may obtain for certain problems might be false solutions or local solutions. For instance, <clears throat> Let's say that for our cost function that we are trying to minimize, we have a system like this. Okay. If we are searching, let's say that we are starting to search here, we are using a certain reinforcement learning process that helps us to see, oh, well, we are moving in the right direction. I continue this way. Why is that? Because the cost is minimizing. So we keep going that way until we reach this point. Once we reach that point, we suddenly notice that it starts to increase here. So we say, oh, we are now going the right direction, in the wrong direction. So we go back, and we may decide that this is the, wrong, the right solution. So it's true that it's a minimum solution, but it's a local minimum solution. The global minimum will have been here. You see? So <coughs> the idea is, uh, if you don't have a very good forecast or trend in the future, you need to somehow explore all the search space to avoid that you get trapped in a minimum cost solution. Uh, with what we are proposing here, everything, of course, depends on the quality of your forecast. Mm. But if you can have a good forecast, you may have not started there. You may have started here, or you may know that this solution is still very far away from what is expected and might be somewhere in this area. So that will move you into this direction. You see? So that's the main aspect here. If we are able to have a good approximation of the future, like in this case will be the futures prices that are available to anybody in the market, we can incorporate that evaluation here. That's the, the trick that we're using. Okay. Yes, in your example, um, random forest has worked better than SBR. Mm -hmm. Is that the case in other, in other conditions? Or? Okay. Um, so it depends on how we evaluate it. That's a good question because when we evaluate it, look at this difference here. SBR worked better than random forest when we use for regression. Uh -huh. When we use for classification, then your, answer, your, your statement was correct. So that helps to answer your question. No, definitely that's not the case. I mean, we can never say that, for, that necessarily one algorithm is always better than others. Otherwise, we just stay with that one all the time. Why are we going to study 200 algorithms if we know that uh, that random forest is always better? So no. Uh, Part of the analysis that we have here, um, and the main problem that we have here with these different <coughs> algorithms, is because we don't know which one is the best one in different moments. So that's a very good point that you make, and that helps me also to introduce you a different problem that we also evaluated here. <coughs> a, a second problem that we may have 
is, like I showed you before, we have all these random forest as a support vector machine, but uh, we will have many other uh, indicators, many other algorithms. One way to deal with them is instead of trying to choose among all of them, <coughs> uh, what we could do is to generate what is called an expert weight. So here, <coughs> in this example, I have each algorithm compared with itself. So basically the forecast of the original algorithm that becomes the benchmark and the new forecast. And if you follow the colors, you have to follow all the details here, the, the one improved is always better than just the benchmark. <coughs> if you compare the algorithm against it, it's our algorithm. But what is important here is we include one that is called expert wave, which is this line here, this brown line here. <coughs> How that forecast is simulated, <coughs> that is a combination of all the other algorithms weighted by their performance. Because the problem is, especially in time series, that it's very hard that the same algorithm would have worked very well everywhere here. So typically what you see is that certain algorithms may work in an upward market, and other algorithms <coughs> may work in a very volatile market. So with the expert weighting approach, we try to combine all of them and give different weights. So we are not choosing. What we do is we let the algorithm decide which one would be the best one. And is, is it a linear combination? Uh, no. Um, I mean, it could be a linear combination <coughs> as a simple average. Yes. Uh, in the way how we use here, it was more an exponential solution. Uh, but frankly, uh, in this point, uh, that's not so important because the original forecast is nonlinear. So every algorithm, the nonlinearity was already incorporated into a real forecast. In this case, we have just integrated all of them. <clears throat> and also, what you mentioned is an important, interesting aspect in econometrics because since the 1960s, that question was already explore econometrics. And <clears throat> the way how it was solved is to say we have to forecast, let's say, the variable y, <clears throat> and we have here different values, beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus epsilon, let's say. <clears throat> the simplest approach is that x1 and x2 are the independent exogenous variables but are forecasting y. But what about if x1, instead of being a simple exogenous variable, is random forest? And x2 is support vector machine, you see? So the input, or I'm sorry, the output of each of these algorithms becomes the input into this equation. So this was a very simple way since the 1960s to combine different forecasts. So as you see, in this case, this is completely linear. <clears throat> Uh, but the underlying algorithm, they may have not been in there. Okay. Another question? Just to refer, anybody else before you? Because you're going to ask me. Please, sorry. Okay. Uh, I have seen that all of them are like, a, like classic machine learning yes. tools. But yes. Of course, you have tried like LC, LSTM or recurrent networks or something like that. Yes, right. Yes, the idea here was not to try the most complex algorithm. I did that in purpose to show that with very well known algorithms, we can have a significant improvement out of them. So now we have very complex methods, yes, like with deep learning. Uh, you have all kinds of variations there. <clears throat> uh, you could have used that here, but these algorithms are very powerful. I mean, why do you need to compli complicate your life so much? You could get very good results here. I would say that you could not use them. We could also use them here, <clears throat> but I will also follow a similar experimental approach. I will not give them more value. I just will compare against exactly the same condition as the others to see if they are better or not. Definitely, I think that they, they would have an advantage because the deep learning models somehow integrates a type series component.
that is more do not integrate that term. Uh, but again, I would follow an experimental approach. Any other comment or question? <coughs> Comment. Have time for one comment or question? Well, if not, you have time to go back uh, directly sure. uh, and ask any questions that you may have. So let me thank you for this conference and ask you for a big applause.